Okay, so we're going to get started this morning um, with exercise 117. A little bit different format for the next series of, uh, or the next module of the class. Um, I'm going to not do the big front end lecture. We're going to go mostly into demo and I'm going to show you how uh, software works. Um, we're moving yet again in software. The class moves fast. Um, we're going to move into AutoCAD. It is not possible for me to teach you everything you need to know in AutoCAD in two and a half to three weeks. That's just the fact. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about that. How many people have already worked in AutoCAD before? Okay. Um, for those of you that have worked in AutoCAD, this will be a breeze. Though I will tell you that I hope that I have a few tips up my sleeve that you haven't thought of that you might get out of this. Um, for those of you that have never been in AutoCAD, that's why we're doing this uh, quick introduction. I will talk through AutoCAD. We will practice AutoCAD. We will actually draw some floor plans and some elevations. Um, and then we'll spend some time with the post-processing part uh, and how do you get good quality drawings out of AutoCAD. And I think that's one of the areas where a true AutoCAD class tends to be deficient is they spend a bunch of time teaching you how to draw in AutoCAD and they spend almost no time in what's called paper space and lay creating layouts and exporting layouts and that kind of thing. So I will spend some time working through layouts and, and having you guys experience that part of it. Uh, we will also take our AutoCAD drawings, we'll make an export of them as a PDF and ultimately bring it into Illustrator and do some collage work over the top of it. So there is a workflow that flows back into Illustrator and I'll walk you guys through that once we get there. So even for those of you that feel like, oh, I've got AutoCAD down, no problem, uh, there's still a few things that I think you can pick up on uh, in this little module of the class. So today we're going to take it real slow. If, for those of you that have worked in AutoCAD, this is a bit of a snooze and you'll breeze through it quickly. Spend the time, um, once you're done with the exercise, working on other class stuff. I promise you, at this point, you must have other stuff <laughs> that you can work on. So spend your time. Uh, don't just waste it uh, and check Facebook or whatever it is you guys do these days. Um, so we're going we're gonna to actually start in AutoCAD. And I want to kind of walk through AutoCAD. There are several versions of AutoCAD that are available on the school computers. The way the licensing works uh, here at DVC, we get the uh, most current version of AutoCAD and all of the Autodesk products. Those are installed on the machines, which means we have a variety of options uh, there. It, Autodesk is the maker of AutoCAD. They also make programs like Revit or Fusion 360 or uh, 3D Studio Max. So they have a variety of products in their, in their wheelhouse. Uh, today we're going to work with the most basic of all of those, which is AutoCAD. Um, there are four icons for AutoCAD on the desktop here. The one we're going to be picking from is the plain AutoCAD. Uh, I think it's important to, to point out why I'm talking about AutoCAD in the first place. Uh, and that is that AutoCAD is still, even though Revit exists and some of the other software programs exist, AutoCAD is still the backbone of most of the design process. Um, somehow they've managed to get a foothold that is so strong that I don't think it's ever going to break. Um, even though a lot of the larger firms are starting to move in the direction of Revit, in my experience, uh, and I, I don't have uh, statistics to really quote for you, but I would, uh, I would guess that probably 60 to 70 percent of the architectural drawings that are done are done in AutoCAD, uh, and then maybe you know 20 percent are done in Revit, and then you know 2 percent are done in like VectorWorks or something like that. So um, I will, I will. I will definitely say that I'm not a big fan of Vectorworks. That's very far down on my list. But um, that is another drawing program that's available. Um, the thing that's, that's great about AutoCAD is it's, it's very, very universal. And generally speaking, no matter what firm you're in, even if you're working in Revit, there's going to be points where you're going to talk to some engineer and he's going to want AutoCAD drawings for it. Or uh, you're going to need to send something to somebody and it'll end up being an AutoCAD. It's, it's just kind of one of those universal design uh, formats that uh, most people need to be familiar with. And so I think it's important to introduce it this early in your careers. Um, one other side note, if you start to feel really comfortable in AutoCAD, Rhino, which is the other class that I teach, uh, that's Archie 136, which of course I would love to see all of you in, for those of you that aren't in it right now. Um, if you feel comfortable in AutoCAD, Rhino works really closely to AutoCAD. So if you know AutoCAD, you know Rhino. If you know Rhino, you know AutoCAD. So that's a nice thing. So. Uh, I've gone ahead and I've opened up that basic AutoCAD uh, software. This is what we're going to be working with. When you first open it up, this is what you're going to see. And we need to go ahead and start with a brand new drawing. Click on the new uh, file button. 
And so right here next to where the A is in the upper left corner, if I click on that new button, it'll open up the select a template uh, and or open it. And so this is where they have a variety of templates that are built into AutoCAD if you wanted to open any one of them. Okay, there we go. Um, so instead of finding the template, click this little triangle next to where it says open, and we're going to open with no template and then imperial because we're going to work in the feet and inches system as opposed to the metric system. So we're going to say uh, open with no template imperial, and that then opens up AutoCAD. So let me talk through what's going on in the AutoCAD window. It looks distinctly different than our traditional uh, Adobe windows that we've been covering thus far in class. So AutoCAD's set up uh, a little bit differently than other programs in that it has a series of tabs that are available up here at the top. They're not menus, they're tabs. And when I click on, say, the Home tab, it's going to give me tools that are most frequently used um, in kind of general drawing. Then we can move on into solids, we can move to surfaces, mesh, visualize, parametric, etc. Like the, um, the Adobe Suite, they do have workspaces that are predefined. This is the default workspace. We can switch our workspaces by clicking this little downward facing arrow at the top of our save, open, new files, etc. And we can turn on our workspace and this, by default, is set for 3D modeling. AutoCAD is awful as a 3D modeler. So just get that in your head. Don't use it for 3D modeling. Um, for whatever reason, they're pushing that. We're going to go back to our basic drafting and annotation mode. Ah, and that looks a lot better for what we're going to be doing in the class. So if you wanted to go do that again, essentially, I need to check the box for workspace so that I can see the workspace up here, and then switch the workspace into drafting and annotation. This is really what we're going to be working with, so there's no reason to see all those three-dimensional objects. It's not that you can't draw with lines and stuff, but we just don't need it for our purposes today. So like I said, there are a series of tabs that are available to us. The Home tab contains most of the stuff that we draw frequently. The way AutoCAD sets this up, the largest buttons are the most frequently used items. So line, polyline, circle, and arc tend to be the most common items that we're going to use in the basic drawing tab. Next to that, we have some less frequently used icons, like our rectangle tool, our ellipse tool, and our hatch tool here. If you want further icons, you can click the down uh, button, and then you get a few more options for other things that you can draw. Um, so they kind of hide it as a way of, of showing it to us. These are the drawing tools. Next to that, we have the modification tools. So if we have an object and we want to change the object, we're going to modify it in some way. Chances are the tools are available to us in here. Next, coming over, these are the annotation tools, text, dimensions, etc. We're not going to be doing annotations in this class, so you don't really need to worry about that. We can skip right over. Next section here are layers. Layers work very differently in AutoCAD than they do in Illustrator or InDesign. So we're going to work with our layers a little bit differently, but I will show you that as we move forward. Today we're not concerned with layers, so we can move right over. Uh, next thing we have are blocks and block inserts. We will cover that in class, but we're not going to do it quite yet. Beyond that, we have our object properties. If I had a line and I wanted to change the line's color or thickness, I would do that right here in the properties window. Uh, and then we move on to things like groups and utilities and clipboard, etc. We're not overly worried about that. You may use the measure tool a couple times, uh, but again, not that relevant. So below that ribbon, where we have these, these various contextual ribbons here, uh, we have our drawing itself. It's called drawing one here. It is showing it to us in a big black box. Now, AutoCAD works a little bit differently than other programs in that the background in AutoCAD is black, the lines that you draw are white. Uh, there were studies done a long time ago that um, when you're spending hours and hours and hours at a computer, which typically if you're drawing in AutoCAD, you're spending hours and hours and hours at a, in a computer, it's much easier for your eyes and the eye strain to be looking at primarily black and then just the white lines, as opposed to the inverse, where you're looking at a white screen and you're drawing black lines. So AutoCAD has black and white reversed. It's the only thing that's reversed. So if you pick a dark gray color, for example, uh, and you draw something in dark gray, it will still look dark gray on black, even though it will print dark gray. Black and white, when you go to print, are flipped. 
So AutoCAD knows that what I'm drawing in white needs to be black. Uh, and so it automatically does that for you. And so it's a little bit weird getting used to that. We're going to be working in this black background model space to be doing the bulk of our drawings. We will cover layouts and um, paper space a little bit later in the class. As we come down here toward the bottom, there's a tiny little box that kind of runs along the bottom here. This is called the command line in AutoCAD. It actually allows us to type in commands. And the faster you are at working in AutoCAD, the more typing you'll do and the less clicking. And it's not something that you're going to pick up on necessarily right away, but it's important to know that it's there. And when you're drawing something, keep an eye on it and look, because it will prompt you, what's the next thing I need to do? What's the next click I need to make? Uh, it'll, it'll prompt you, and that can be a really good thing. Uh, we have, like I said, our model space and then our, our paper space, our layout tabs. We'll get to those a little bit later in the class. As I move over to the right, there are a bunch of little boxes that can, we can turn on and turn off. For our purposes right now, I'm actually going to have you turn something off that will um, kind of help explain the initial drawings in AutoCAD. So I want you to go all the way over to the corner here. There's three parallel lines. And if you click on that, we open up our customization here. And I want you to check the box next to dynamic input right here. That brings up the dynamic input little toggle which is right here at the bottom. So by clicking it here, we're just turning the button on. And then we can choose to turn dynamic input on or off. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. So it's going to be uh, deselected. It won't be highlighted in blue. Uh, and that will just will end up with dynamic input back on. But it'll help my explanation for how AutoCAD works a little bit better. So I want to have that turned off as I initially start my drawing. So in terms of interacting with the screen, we do a lot of zooming in and zooming out. Uh, and that's done just with your scroll wheel. You'll also see that when I zoom in and zoom out, there's a little XY axis. You guys might remember this from like math class or whatever, when you used to have to do little graphs and you know the slope function and whatever. Uh, the good news is we don't have to know a lot about math here, but it's important to, to kind of explain how AutoCAD works. So in, uh, in the world of AutoCAD, we draw everything full size. So we're not doing any scaling. So if a wall is 20 feet long, we draw a 20 foot line. So everything's at full size. That's important. And the other thing is that AutoCAD controls these lines through a coordinate system. So there are actual coordinates, just like you had a sheet of graph paper in front of you. The origin, or 0, 0 in the coordinate system, is where these two x and y uh, lines meet, that, where that symbol meets on the page. And so we're going to start our drawing there. And then we'll work, work our way out. And I'm going to walk you through the coordinate system. It's all in part one. But before we do that, I want to confirm that we're in the correct units. Because sometimes when you open a new document, they're not in the correct units, or you pick the wrong template, etc. So before I draw anything, I'm going to go ahead and type on the keyboard units. Maybe not. There we go. And I'll press Enter afterward. And so when I do that, it turns out I was in, in, in the correct units. So I'm going to go ahead and right here under a length, I'm going to change from decimal to architectural. And my angle will, will remain in decimal degrees. So I'm going to change my length to architectural. And then I'll go ahead and say OK. So you'll notice on the handouts, when I give you these handouts, uh, the same thing online. Let me flip over to the online version here. Oops. I had this all pulled up before I had to restart the computer. Um, when I give you a handout or when it's online, when I talk about typing something in, it's in like a typewriter font. So it's in a different font, so you can tell that I'm, I'm saying type this value in. Do you guys see that on the sheet? And you see that online. So I try really hard. Sometimes I miss it, but for the most part, I try to use that just so you know it's a, it's a text input. I'm actually typing it into the computer. So I've done that. I've got my units confirmed as correct. I've turned off my dynamic input. It's now time to start actually drawing. And so if I were to start drawing, I could pick the line tool or the polyline tool. The handout says polyline. We'll get to polyline in a second. But I want to illustrate something first. If I pick the line tool and I say, OK, well, I'm going to start my drawing right where this x and y meet. And I move my mouse over to where those two x and y's meet. 
and I say, okay, that's right where it starts, and I click. As soon as I start to zoom in, you'll see that, well, wait a minute, I'm not where the X and Y met anymore. So, okay, I need to be a little bit more accurate. Let me try that again. I'll come in here, and I'm going to be real careful with my mouse, and, yep, that's, that's it right there. And then I start to zoom in, and, nope, I'm still not there. So AutoCAD is or can be accurate up to 16 decimal places. So it's really, really accurate in terms of where the line is going. And so you can't necessarily pick an exact coordinate just using the mouse. So this is where typing in a value can be really beneficial. So I'm going to go back to the polyline tool for a second here. Instead of the line tool, I've clicked on polyline. And instead of trying to click where the X and Y meet, I'm going to type in 0, comma, 0. And so when I type in that coordinate of 0, 0, essentially what I'm doing is I'm telling the computer, start my line at exactly where X and Y meet. And so when I press Enter, it starts at 0, 0. And no matter how much I zoom in, it's always going to be right where X and Y meet. So I'm using that to my advantage by specifying a given point. So like I said, this works as a coordinate system, so I can use that as I continue drawing. So the next coordinate that I want you to type is 0, 24, and then we need to tell it 24 feet, and I'll do that by pressing the apostrophe on the keyboard. So it'll be 24 apostrophe for 24 feet. So what I'm telling it is go 0 in the x direction and then go 24 feet in the y direction. So go 24 feet straight up to create this line. I'll go ahead and press enter when I'm done and it will then draw a line. Now sometimes AutoCAD doesn't like to zoom out far enough for us. So in my case it's not zooming out all the way. I'll go ahead and press enter to finish and then I'll type Z for zoom and then E for extents. And I should really put that in the handout so you guys can see it. And that way I can see the full 24 feet of my line. Again, it depends on the template when you go to open it as to whether you're seeing everything. So this line starts at 0, 0, starts at the origin, and is 24 feet long along the Y axis. Now I want to continue on here, so I'll go back to the polyline tool and when I hover my mouse over the end, I get this little green box, a little green square, and I get a little text that says endpoint. This is called an object snap. And what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I'm close to the end of this line. Make sure that I start my new line exactly where the end of the last line is. If I didn't have that snap, if I turn that snap off, and I said, okay, I want to create a polyline, and I'm just going to try to, to line this up and be right at the end, the same thing would happen. As soon as I zoom in, I'd find that I didn't really start where the line um, ended. So instead, I'm going to make sure that I have polyline, and I will use that snap, and when I see that little green box, I know that I'm going to click right at the end of this line, and there we go, I can continue on my way. So the next point we're going to use is... 12 feet, comma, 24 feet. So I'll type 12 apostrophe, comma, 24 apostrophe. And then I'll press enter. And that creates a new line that's 12 feet long. It goes 12 feet in the x direction, and it's up 24 feet in the y direction. So these two coordinates that we just typed, the 0, comma, 24 feet, and the 12, comma, 24 feet, are called absolute coordinates. They're coordinates that start from 0, 0 and are somewhere in space in my drawing. So if I knew I wanted a line uh, that was 24 feet long, I, and I knew that it was right starting at 0, 0, it's pretty easy to deduce, oh, I want it to be 0, 24 feet. And then I can do this line at 12, 24 feet, which is going to create the end point of this line. If I wanted to keep going, I could keep calculating out what these would be. So the next one, if I wanted a line that was 6 feet down here, I would say this is uh, 12 feet, comma, what is it, uh, 18 feet. Uh, sorry, I didn't put my foot mark in. There we go. 12 feet, comma, 18 feet, and that would draw this next part. 
The problem there is it involves a lot of mental configuration, because you always have to know relative to the origin, where's the next point. And so figuring out that this was 12 feet, 18 feet is a lot different than saying, oh, I want a line that's 6 feet long starting here, ending here. So we can, instead of using absolute coordinates, we can use something called a relative coordinate. And what the relative coordinate means is it says, okay, at the last point that I clicked, relative to that point, where is my new line going to go? So it's kind of like resetting where 0, 0 is each time. So in this case, I know I want to go 6 feet down from the last point I clicked. So I would say relative, so the at sign, it's like the email at sign. So relative to that point, where do I want to go? Well, I want to go 0 in the x direction, don't want to go anywhere, and I want to go negative 6 or down by 6 feet. So I type 0, comma, so at 0, comma, negative 6 apostrophe for negative 6 feet, and I go ahead and press enter. So that's relative to the last point. So if I continued on this, if I wanted a line that was 12 feet going to the right, relative to the last point I clicked, I would want it going 12 feet, comma, 0, and then I'll press enter. So it's always relative to the last point that you clicked. So I could do that once again at, this time I want to go down, so it would be at 0, comma, negative 12 feet, going down. So the key difference here is whether you put the at sign in front of the coordinate or not when you're telling it relative to the last point. So I can continue to fill out my shape here. This would be at negative 12 feet, comma, 0. And then I could flip over and do an absolute coordinate. So this one would be no at sign. It would be just uh, 12 feet, comma, 0 would give me that point. So I can flip back and forth. But again, that takes some math and some practice to kind of know. And I could finish by typing 0, comma, 0, or I could snap to the end of this line. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press the Enter key to finish, and now I have this basic shape laid out. So that is the fundamental difference between an absolute coordinate and a relative coordinate. And there are places where this is useful. Uh, and I'll give you an example. You guys don't have to draw this, but I'll give you an example. Let's say that I was out here in space and I wanted to do uh, a sloping line. And I knew that I wanted that sloping line to be over 12 feet and up 4 feet. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to use a relative coordinate. I could say at 12 feet, comma, 4 feet, and I could create that sloping line because I know what the slope should be. And so that can be a big advantage when you're drawing long term. OK, so what about, I understand the difference between an absolute and a relative coordinate, but what is the way that people tend to actually model? And that's where this dynamic input thing, the thing that I had you turn off initially, I'm going to go ahead and have you turn that one back on. It's the little plus sign with the box next to it, the filled in rectangle next to it. We'll turn that dynamic input back on. And what you can do here is, and I'm not starting at the origin right now because I'm going to illustrate this from over here. When I start, instead of now having to type at 0, 24 feet, I can actually just type a distance. So I'm putting my mouse in a direction, and you see that I've get, got a little text box that I can fill in that's telling me what the distance would be. And you know, I could keep moving my mouse and try to get it precise, or I could just type in 24 feet. So essentially, it's direction and then distance. So I move the mouse in the direction I want to go, and then I type in the distance I want to go. So it's much quicker to go distance and direction. Oops, sorry. And then six feet, and then I'll come back to where I started, like that. So with that dynamic input on, it's pretty quick to just go di direction and then distance. And so I wanted to, to turn that one off so that you guys understood the difference between an absolute and a relative coordinate. And there will be times where you'll want to use an absolute or a relative coordinate. But for the most part, you'll leave dynamic input on, and you'll go ahead and just type in um, your direction and your distance. OK, so I'll delete this extra little shape here, and we'll go back to my first shape, this one right here. 
I'm going to take, I actually created this shape in two pieces. I have this piece and I have that piece. I'm going to select them both, there and there, and I'm going to join them together. Uh, join should be available somewhere in these tools. I always type join, so I'm not quite sure where it is. I think it's this tool right here, join. You can also type in join, and that just connects these together into one continuous little shape. So what I'm ultimately going to be creating, if you flip the page over, is this little mini floor plan on the back. It's just something to draw. And so first thing I need to do is develop the thickness of the walls. And we're going to use generic numbers here, not precise numbers. I'm going to say that the walls are six inches thick, and so that I want to create a line that's inside of this by six inches. Could I go to the polyline tool, and could I you know, start a new line and, and draw it? Yeah but it's a whole lot easier to use a command called an offset. And it's available right here. It's kind of, it looks like a C on the tool set here. Alternatively, I could type in offset into the command line. When I click on offset, I'm going to look down here at the command line and say, what is it telling me? It says offset, specify offset distance. So I need to go ahead and type in what I want the distance to be. So in this case, I want the distance to be six inches. And to type in inches, I'm going to use the quotation mark. So feet is an apostrophe. Inches would be quotation mark. So I go ahead and type in six inches, or six quotation mark. I'll press Enter. Then it says, select objects to offset. Well, I want to offset this object here. Then it says, select point on side to offset. This is essentially saying, do I want the offset to happen to the outside, or do I want it to happen to the inside? And so in this scenario, I want it to happen to the inside. So I go ahead and click on the inside of my shape, and I get my whole second set of lines. If this was not a continuous shape, so if I hadn't joined those two pieces together, and I had this separate from that, when I went to do the offset, again, the six inches is the same. It would offset there, and I'd have to do it again for that part of the offset. And I'd end up with these little overlapping corners that I'd have to clean up later on. So it's good habit, when you're working with something like this, to go ahead and join these together first. So I'll go back to Join, and then I'll offset again. Distance is still set at 6 inches, and I'll offset those to the inside. So I have those two parallel lines. Those represent the walls that go around the outside of my building. The next thing that I need to do is I need to work on creating where the door and the windows would fall in this particular shape. So if we look at the drawing on the back, I have a three-foot door that's exactly in the center of this wall. So the first thing that I would like to do is I'd like to use a line, and I'd like to draw a line right here in the center. Well, how exactly do I know where the center is? Right now I don't. But I can come down here to my snaps. It's a, it's a rectangle with a little square rectangle in the corner. I can click the arrow next to it, and I can choose to turn on what's called a midpoint snap. So once again, I've lo looked at my snaps, my object snaps. I've clicked the arrow next to it, and then I've checked the box for midpoint snap. And with midpoint snap checked, when I go to draw my line, I'm going to get, instead of a box, I'm going to get a little triangle. And that triangle represents the midpoint of this line. So this is exactly six feet from that edge and six feet from that edge. But I didn't have to measure it. So I'm going to snap to the midpoint there. I'll come down to the middle here and snap to that midpoint right there. When I'm done, I'll press the Enter key on the keyboard and I'm left with just this little line that is right in the center of where that doorway would be. So I know that the door is three feet wide, so I need to be able to offset this half of three feet this way and half of three feet that way. So I'll use the same tools, offset, that we just used. The difference here is that the distance is going to be more. So half of 36 inches or three feet would be 18 inches. Now I have a variety of ways of putting this in. 
So if I know that three feet is 36 inches, half of 36 would be 18 inches. I could type in 18 inches and that would do it. If I don't know how many inches are in three feet, I could say, well, I know that would be one foot six inches. I could type in one foot followed by six quotation mark and that would get me the same result. So depending on how you want to, to slice it. I could also do 1.5 feet. So I get the same result in, in any scenario. So AutoCAD will do the math for me. And there it is at one foot six. I'll click on the side that I want to offset. So we'll do it to that side. I'm then going to repeat and do the same line to the opposite side. So I took the middle line here and I offset one direction to create that line. Then I offset the other direction to create this line. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press enter on the keyboard. And now I'm done. This line and this line represent the edges of my door. This line in the middle here is actually irrelevant. So I could select it by clicking on it and then press the delete key on the keyboard to make it go away. Now I need to open up these walls so that this becomes an actual opening. So this is where the trim command is going to come into play. So up here in the modify window, I have the ability to choose trim. It looks like a pair of scissors. Interestingly enough, the little pop-up here that shows up shows cutting a door for trim. So it's exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on trim. And I look down here at my command line. It says select objects or select all. So I'm going to go ahead and select the objects that I want to work with. So in this case, it would be these two and the two lines here. I could click on each set. One, two, three, four. But that can end up being a little tedious if I had more objects to try to work with. So instead, I could select by dragging a group through this particular object. So there's two ways of selecting in AutoCAD, and I this is a good place to, to kind of point that out. If I select from left to right, it's going to select any object that is completely contained within my little selection boundary. So from left to right, this selection would only select those two little lines. Alternatively, if I select from right to left, anything, and notice that the color's different. Left to right is blue, right to left is green. If I select anything right to left, it's anything that this box touches. So it would be those two lines plus the two lines that it went through. So there's two different ways of selecting, and you have to kind of get used to one or the other. It can be very beneficial. So I've done that. I'm going to go ahead and press Enter because I've selected my objects. Then it's going to ask me what to trim. As I move my mouse over this line, you see that I get a little, it kind of grays out the line and then it puts a red X next to it. That would be the first line that I want to trim. I'll hover my mouse over here and I'll go ahead and trim out the second one. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press the Enter key on the keyboard. I might have to press it twice. No, there we go. And now I end up with the hole that is in my wall. These lines are no longer connected because I, I went through and I trimmed those out. So I could take all of these and then I could join them together using the join tool and make them into one continuous line again. Doesn't really matter for what we're doing right now whether they end up being continuous or not. So now at this point, I need to go ahead and I need to draw my window. And so I have a window that's on this side and a window that's on this side. And I knew, know based on the measurements here that my window starts one foot six over from this corner and it's a two foot window. So if I go back to my uh, line tool here, I can hover my mouse over this point at the corner and I haven't clicked anything and I could move my mouse to the right. And you'll see that I'll get a little green plus mark that's left in the corner, and then I'll get a green dotted line going next to it. This is referencing that first point, and I can actually type in a value. So I could say one foot six inches, and it'll jump at one foot six inches from that corner, and let me draw that line right there. I could do it again, starting at this point, and I can move over, oops, 
by two feet. That one, I did a bad job here. That's hover, there we go. And I could say two feet. And then I could draw that line there. And so you guys, the logical question would be, what's the difference between just starting with a line here on the corner and saying, oh, let me go over one foot six. And then I'll go ahead and draw that line down. And then I'll start again with a line and I'll draw over two feet and then one foot down or, or uh, six inches down. So in that case, we end up with lines that are on top of other lines. So this line here is on top of that set of lines. So we end up with lines on top of lines. And if we went to go print this, we could have printing problems. It's also kind of a cleanliness issue where we have extra lines that we really just don't need. Uh, and so in the world of AutoCAD, we try hard not to do that. By using uh, the tracking from this point, it's a much cleaner way of drawing. Getting used to how to use that is important. I'm going to encourage you today to practice with it so you feel comfortable. Uh, if you do it with the lines, you'll have to go back in and delete these lines to get rid of them. There is also a command called overkill that's in AutoCAD that will let you get rid of lines on top of other lines. Um, I'm not going to go through how to do it, but I wanted to throw that out there as something that you can use. Okay, so I have those set up. So I have these on either side. I actually didn't need these two yet. I have this first window set up here. I'm going to draw one more line that's right in the center of those two windows just to kind of denote that it's a window. Nothing too fancy, just the line. Uh, the copy center conveniently didn't print any of the thin lines on this page, so it would normally have a line through the middle of the window, but it didn't copy correctly. Uh, if you look at this on the course website here, you can see the little line in the center of the windows. Actually, this one's embellished a little more. It has a little uh, um, window sill that sticks out and whatever. You don't have to do all that detail. Okay, so I have that line. Now, this window here is the same on the other side of this door. So I could copy this window over, but I could also, because it's symmetrical, I could use the mirror command to take this window, mirror it, and put it on this side. So when I select these windows, and this is a good example of where the selection matters, I would select from left to right to select the whole window. If I selected from right to left, I'd get the walls and the window. So I'm going to make sure that I'm selecting from left to right to select that window. I'll go up and choose mirror from my tools. There it is. It says specify first point of mirror line. This is the line that you want to um, mirror along. So I don't have a center here anymore. I don't have a midpoint. So I can scroll out and then move down to the bottom and select the midpoint here because of the way the building's set up. It's the same midpoint. I can then create my mirror line right through the door there. And then do I want to erase the source objects? Yes or no? No, I do not. And now I have a copy of this window on this side. So I didn't have to draw it again. There's nothing wrong with drawing it again. You could, of course, draw it again, but you don't have to. So now I have this same window here appears down here at the bottom. So I can use mirror again to take that, and I'll mirror this time with a mirror line that goes across in the center here to put that window down at the bottom. Do I want to erase the source objects? No. And that gives me that window. So I've mirrored once to create this window. I've mirrored again to create that window. Now I have a, another window that's six inches from this window. So it's a good place to go ahead and copy a window. So I can select from left to right to select this window. And I can go up to copy. When I click on copy, it says specify a base point. That's where to copy from. Now the logical thing, or what people tend to do, is they say, oh, well, let me just copy from this point. Now you get over here and you have to either know the distance from the first point to be able to tell it how far it is, or you have to drop the object and then move it later. Instead of doing that, if you select the object and type copy, and then reference your copy from point to this point. So I know that the windows are six inches apart, so I will reference, I'll go back, by six inches, and now I'm copying from a point six inches from the edge of my window, which lets me snap to that point right there. So it's a little bit easier to set it up that way and to get a good copy. 
So I'll select this again. I'm just repeating myself. I'll go up to copy. I will hover over this corner, move to the left, no clicking done yet. Type six inches. Now I'm copying from a point that's six inches from the edge of my window and I'll then snap to that point right there. Looks like I have this same window on this wall. And so you could go back and start drawing it again, or we could actually use the mirror command in a little bit of a different way. I could take this first window, I can go to mirror, and instead of mirroring in our traditional horizontal or vertical, I'm actually going to mirror at a 45 degree angle. So I'll go from here to there, and when I mirror, it's kind of like when you were in 130 and you did those reflection lines to pull, line, to pull distances, same kind of thing here, where I can mirror across that 45 to create that window there. So it's all about efficiency. Could I redraw the window every time? Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. It just takes a little bit longer. And so as you get faster, you learn these kinds of efficiencies. Okay, so I've drawn those windows. Uh, last thing I'll do is I'll draw the door here, and then I'll let you guys get started. I'm not going to draw everything. Um, you guys can draw as much as you have time for drawing. If you feel really comfortable in AutoCAD and want to tweak it and change it to be your own floor plan, that's perfectly fine. If you want to add any extra detail, that's fine as well. So when it comes time for our door, I'm going to go ahead and use the rectangle tool for the door. It asks me for the first corner, so I'll pick the corner of the door right there. Now here's a perfect opportunity to use our coordinates. I want to make sure that I'm using relative coordinates, so I'll type the at sign. And now I need to type the, essentially the, the dimensions of this door. So in this case, it would be the x direction first. So this would be the thickness of the door. It would be 1.75 inches. You could round. You could say 2 inches. It doesn't really matter to me. The distances don't matter. It's the concept here. 1.75, comma, how deep is the door? Well, it's a three-foot door, so this would be 1.75 comma negative three feet because it's going down. So I'd have to type minus three feet, and then I'll go ahead and press enter, and it's going to create that rectangle for me. So one more time, I'll do that in repetition here. We'll click the rectangle tool. I'll start from this corner here. I'll type in a relative coordinate of at first coordinate, 1.75 in the x direction, comma, negative 3 feet in the y direction, and I'll go ahead and press enter, and there it is. In that scenario, I didn't type the inch mark. My default units are in inches, so I didn't technically have to, uh, though frequently I do for, for the habit of it. So I have that installed. I now need to do the door swing, or the arc of the door. There's an arc tool here, but it's not the easiest arc tool to use. If I click the downward arrow under arc, there's actually another arc tool that's start, end, and direction. It's about halfway down. And if you click on that, that one's the easiest, I think, for creating a door swing. And so all I have to do is specify the start point there, the end point there, and the direction. So do I want it to be going in or going out? So I get to where this is horizontal, it snaps to that green line, and then I go ahead and click, and that creates the arc for me. So I'll do that one more time as well. So it's the arc, start, end, and direction. Start, end, and direction there for my arc. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys get started on this. Today is very much about kind of getting your feet wet in AutoCAD. If you've never touched AutoCAD before, I get that it's going to take you all day to create maybe one window or maybe a little bit of this drawing. If you've worked and you're very fluent in AutoCAD and it's easy for you to adapt, you're going to breeze through this. There are always other things for you to be working on. I would encourage you, if you finish this quickly, work on something from some other class. Use your time wisely.